Welcome to Dig Deep, the mining podcast. In this podcast, we go deep into mining news, hot topics, and live interviews with mining professionals and leading figures in the mining industry. Introducing your host, Rob Tyson, founder and director of Mining International and Mining International Executive, a leading global mining recruitment and headhunting agency. Hi, mining community. Welcome back to another episode of the Dig Deep, the mining podcast. And we have a returning guest who appeared back in December 2021, um, which is our 200th episode. So Mark Crafani, who's the chairman of Barley Based Metals, um, who are one of the biggest uh, sustainable mining companies in the world, uh, mining base metals such as iron ore, copper, manganese and ferro alloys uh, across the world. Um, Mark was the former CEO of Anglo-American, um, having steered the company for, for over nine years before stepping down uh, last year to focus on other things, including various directorships with Langaro and Total. Um, we're going to chat about um, what Mark has been doing since obviously we last spoke, um, talk about mining as a brand and how to improve the industry's image and the energy transition. Um, Mark's going to be attending Europe's largest mining event, resourcing tomorrow, uh, which is formerly known as Mines and Money London which is taking place in London on the 28th to 30th of November. Um, So it's an ultimate platform uh, to meet with mining decision makers, gain valuable insights from the industry leaders um, and expand your professional network. Um, With a remarkable 20 year history, um, this event has built a strong reputation for fostering new business relationships across the entire uh, mining value chain. So tickets are selling fast, so please register Uh, your interest um, and you can save, um, make some savings if you register before the 17th of October. So uh, please uh, head to the the website, which I'll include uh, in the show notes, the companies, um, so you can get some money off your tickets. So let's move on to the podcast. So let's welcome Mark. How you doing, Mark? Very good. Thank you, Rob. Great to be here. Yeah, and I appreciate your time. And uh, obviously we were speaking off air and... uh, it seems you are uh, you are pretty pretty busy even stepping down from a, a CEO position with Anglo, um, and obviously your time's uh, fulfilled doing a number of different things. So, obviously, I guess most of our audience will know you, um, but I just wanted to just give us a quick snapshot of uh, of yourself, um, your career, and and what you've been doing more recently. Okay, then. Well, I'm I'm uh, married to Luana. I've had seven kids. Uh, that terrorised me no end. Um, I've been working in the mining industry for 47 years. I grew up originally in a, in Australia in a place called Wollongong. We like to uh, boast that it's the intellectual capital of the country. Unfortunately, most people who come from other parts of Australia don't agree with us, uh, but it's a good fun place on the coast. Used to surf all the time. I started in coal mines, then I went to the gold mining industry, uh worked uh, for almost 30 years, sorry, almost uh, 25 years in Australia. Then I ended up uh, going to Canada working for a base metals company, Inco, actually, uh, that uh, was the original company before Vale, the company I'm now working with, owned it. Uh, I worked there for five years, then to South Africa for six years as chief executive of Anglo Gold Ashanti. And then in the last nine years before retiring in 2022, I was the Chief Executive of Anglo-American. Today, as you said, um, base, I'm the chair of the new base metals group that Vale's uh, formed and, and had some sh- new shareholders come in. Uh, director of Total Energy has been there for six years. Uh, really interesting in terms of the energy transition. Lango Rook, great company going through a lot of restructuring and thinking about how it does projects in the future. I'm the chair of the Power of Nutrition does wonderful work uh, with uh, children through Asia and um, uh, Africa, other parts of the world, preventing stunting in young children, so making sure they're getting the right nutrition and mothers the same. Uh, Really big impact. Uh, I'm a uh, director of uh, the Development Partner Institute, which is about ethical business and ethical mining businesses. And I'm also uh, the head of the International Advisory Committee for... um, uh, the Global Foundation, which is also about ethical business and how we can bring countries 
communities and, and companies together for uh, uh, ethical business and a couple of other things, uh, mentoring through CMI, so some other interesting things, but it's usually focused on and around people, and that's me. Yeah. Um, obviously, given your uh, retirement from Anglo-American, um, why did you step back into the, the bull ring, obviously, of as the chair of Varley Base Metals? Well, it wasn't my intention to come back into a, a mining role. What I thought I'd do is I would have one board role in mining, but the other, uh, the other work I'm doing um, is really different. Uh, very interesting, and it does all connect to mining, particularly the ethical business side, sustainability, and and how we promote the industry differently. But what interested me was one, I I knew the business, and it, it has struggled a little bit in the last uh, ten or twelve years. It was also a business that was looking at sourcing, in particular, critical minerals that the world is short of, and it really needed to think about doing it differently. It really wanted to set a new model for sustainability in the industry. And that's always been a great interest of mine. And they were looking at building and growing a business and they want this business to be as significant as their current iron ore business. So that would make it one of the top five businesses in the world. So for me, too hard to say no to given um, uh, the scope of the work they want to do. It wasn't in an executive role. And that was the other point. I said, I'm happy to do it as a chair and help uh, support and steer the team when it's sometimes needed, but more generally support the team building a very new type of business for the mining industry. I want to give, give us a, an overview of the uh, Varley Base Metals uh, uh, company and division. Yep. So um, the business is focused or currently operates in Brazil, uh, has two very large copper mines. It also has a nickel mine called Onsa Puma, and it has uh, three or four new copper prospects, which could be quite significant and a great exploration portfolio in South America. And that sits next to or near their um, big iron ore business. So uh, very active in Brazil, significant business there. In Canada, we have uh, Sudbury, which was the second largest fully integrated nickel, copper, uh, metals operation in the world after the big Norilsk operation in um, Russia. So it's a really interesting operation. As I said, it's probably the second largest fully integrated mining business in the world. Um, Boise Bay, big new discovery 20 years ago, 20, 30 years ago, and now transitioning from open cut to underground. Again, interesting, uh, big refinery up in Long Harbour, Manitoba, uh, getting to the end of life, but there's some fantastic nickel opportunities around those areas. So again, uh, potentially lots lots of things that we can do. And then uh, there's the Indonesian operations where uh, we are currently operating a very large mine in a, on the island of Sulawesi, but there's another three or four new nickel developments with the Chinese, believe it or not, that makes it also very interesting. We've got a refinery up in Japan but quite simply, what we're about is trying to take those businesses and improve and grow their performance, but then double the business again over the next five to 10 years so that we really become the largest fully integrated base metals producer or, if you like, critical metals producer in terms of energy transition and also providing metals for all sorts of interesting applications and specialty applications. So it's, it's a large business that would like to grow, but first it has to do better in terms of its returns and margins, and that's where we've got to start. How do you see your roles with uh, Total and Lango Rourke uh, connecting you with the Varley role? That's a good question. Um, the reason I, I stuck with the Total role, I'd already done six years, and I was thinking that that, that was probably it. But they didn't want me to go. And when I sat back and thought about it, they're right in the middle of the energy transition. So Total is traditionally an oil and gas producer that's been transitioning. 30% of its investments today are in renewable energy, and they're rapidly increasing that portfolio. So for me, great place to see and understand the energy transition from a traditional perspective with a company that's really investing serious money in renewables. 
Secondly, with Lang O'Rourke involved in infrastructure and, and Ray and Cuthall and, and uh, Dennis and the rest of the team are very much focused on what a new construction company should look like and how it can improve its business, its efficiencies, and provide governments and companies with new models for construction for the future. So when I think about minerals and metals, I think about infrastructure because we, we require a lot of infrastructure. So the connection to Lang O'Rourke works well. And then the energy transition, and Lang O'Rourke's involved in Hinkley Point and other major projects uh, on the nuclear side. So all of those pieces connect in some way, shape or form. And I think they also provide us with ideas on how we can mine better and, and be more effective as businesses um, in the resources sector. So they do connect. Yeah. And I suppose following on from that, you're you're involved in all these different sectors. So where does the mining industry need to go to address its, I suppose, its difficulty or negative reputation? And I suppose how how can it or what what have you seen so far in working the, within these different industries? How can mining um better its brand? Well, I think I think the first thing, and we don't do this well is explain mining's role in society. And I think you and I have talked about this before. Very simply put, we make the materials that make the world work. Um, there's a saying I said, in 450 BC, an ancient philosopher from Greek said, talked about the nature of things. And they said there are four things that make up uh, how things work in the world. Air, water, fire, and earth. Now, today, I think we'd say air, water, energy, and minerals. And the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, understood that we use minerals for everything. Um, the agricultural sector could only feed half the world without fertilizers. If you look at building cities and infrastructure, we take up 15% of the Earth's surface for those constructions. If we didn't or if we weren't able to build buildings with uh, more than one or two storeys, we'd have to, and we use steel and all sorts of metals to achieve that, our footprints would literally be almost double what they are today without minerals to keep our footprint low. So if you take agriculture and um, uh, urban environments that we shrink our footprint, human activity would take up 80% of the Earth's surface. Today, somewhere between 50 and 60%. And so net, in terms of net positive outcomes, the mineral industry is the most significantly net positive industry in the place of the planet when you look at how much we shrink human footprint. Nobody knows that, and we don't tell anybody that. So that's important, and we make everything else work, whether it's purifying water, providing medicines for health, all those things. On the other side, we could do what we do better. And by that, I mean we could continue to reduce our water consumption, energy consumption, make sure that our minds are tighter and, and more environmentally friendly in the communities in which we work, we can contribute more through infrastructure and connecting with our local communities so they can see we're a much more positive uh, contributor in terms of local communities. And when people ask me, but how big is the mining footprint? And when I said that, you know, agriculture and cities and everything take up around 55% of the Earth's surface, mining actually takes up 0.3%. So what people don't realise is how small uh, small the land we take up, but we're certainly very impactful on that 0.33%. So as an industry, how do we make our impact smaller and do better with what we've got? I still think that's a challenge for us as an industry, but we, we, have, to, we have to tell the whole story much better than we have. Yeah, and I suppose also it comes down to education. Do you think that schools should teach, and you probably say yes, and I wondered how, how we would do this. Do you think schools should teach mining as as part of their curriculum? Um, and again, maybe at what age? How does it how, how is it brought in? Um, because I, I take it people don't know anything about mining because they're not taught anything about mining at school. 
I do. I remember when I was back at school, my kids are amazed that I can remember that far back. And there's a thing we called social studies, where you looked at how the world worked. Now, what I would love to see, and we're working with Exeter University and, and Camborne School of Mines and other in academic institutions, that how do, we, how do we help kids understand how the world works? And when you start talking about how the world works, you have to say, okay, well, uh, how do we use mineral, you know, air, water, energy, minerals? How do they all connect for us to grow food or build shelter or purify water or where do medicines come from to keep us healthy? All the things that we use mineral products for, people don't understand. There's a, a story I tell of a conversation I had with the minister, and I won't say the country or the minister, when they said, look, we're going to lock the, the country down because of COVID. And he said that, uh, and it was a he, said, look, uh, we need you to stop everything. And I said, well, wait a minute. Uh, we operate in a few communities here. Do you want me to stop running the water? He said, oh, no, 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 of course not. We've got to keep the water going. Okay, so shut everything down except the water. I said, what about the lights and the energy? Oh, no, 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 no. We've got to keep the lights on. And the, oh, Okay, so shut everything down except the water and the energy. I said, what about transport for food to the corner shop? Because in most of these places, and this is in Africa, obviously, um, they don't have the big uh, grocery stores or Waitrose or Sainsbury's. Or, uh, and, and in many cases, they don't have refrigeration. So food lasts two or three days. I said, so do we stop food delivery? Oh, no, 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 we can't stop food deliveries. And I said, well, what about fertilisers for the farm? But, and he said, no, 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 we won't have anything to eat next year. And so he stopped when I said about the fifth or sixth point. He said, okay, I understand. And I said to him, you can't stop how the world works. And most people don't know how the world works. And when you spill all that out, he said, what we've got to do is get with business and we'll get with you guys tomorrow. And over three or four days, we business, the government, the bureaucrats, and key players in different communities and in industries came together and we worked out how to manage and keep all these things moving and at the same time help protect people through COVID. Because as companies, we had big halls where we could help with vaccinations or testing, a whole range of things. We all contributed and got together. And in my view, those types of learnings in schools through social studies help kids understand how the things work. And in that conversation, minerals is much more clearly a really important part of life that most people today don't understand. Can governments do more uh, to help the, the energy transition? Um, and are they making sort of policies that are helping uh, the global energy transition? Obviously, we hear a lot in, a lot in the media but I suppose behind the scenes, what is there anything else they can be doing? Policy frameworks are really important. So having access to land where these minerals are available is one thing. Having policies that allow a dialogue that's constructive both ways. And, and, and one thing I would make, an important point I would make, there's certainly been cases in the past where mining companies or businesses have not taken proper account of local community requirements or government requirements. And we have, have to do better, and we've been improving, but I think we've still got more to do. At the same time, local communities, and they could be Indigenous groups, it could be First Nation groups, have to be taken into proper account in how we work out what we can do where there may be constraints, how we look after the environment better, how do we make sure we don't have an environmental event? And these are critical points that we can improve on, but we've got to come together and find these solutions together. Because at the end of the day, um, it's very difficult if one group says you can't access these minerals, therefore we can't manage an energy transition. So that's not going to work. We can't without considering their views, access these, access these minerals without being respectful uh, of their local issues. Um, it could be something around the, the, the way people 
interface with the land. You've got to remember that we've still got agriculture and other things that we need to do. So how do we get those balances right? We've all got to be in there. It's got to be a dialogue, and those those issues have got to be properly taken into account. And I don't think we're doing that anywhere near as well as we could. And that's certainly, um, that interface, I think, is really important. Um, we often or sometimes hear about the, the dreaded resource uh, curse. Is is there such a thing? Well, yes, uh, there can be, but it's not because the resources are there. It's because of what we do or governments do or other players do that's inappropriate. So if I give you an example, if, and I use this as a very specific example, I was mining, or we had a mine when I was at Anglo Gold Shanty in Guinea. And um, we started in the population, the local population was 10,000 people. About uh, 1,000 people got jobs and they were paid very well. Now, when you build a mine, people are well paid, 10% of the people were employed and they got well paid. They paid uh, and they spent more money and goods and services costs rose, but they could afford it. But the other 90% of the community didn't get that salary. So for them, the cost of goods and services rose. So they say, you know what? It's okay if you're in the mine, but we're not in the mine. We don't get the money. So as a miner, what we had to do was make contributions in other ways. So we manned up the power station because the country didn't have the resources to run power, so we kept the lights on, literally. We put in new roads so that people could get uh, agricultural product to market. We had an emergency health system or a health, um, um, like a small hospital on site. And it was interesting, the most important service that the community drew from that was helping women with difficult pregnancies. Now, I wouldn't have predicted that, but for them, that was the most valuable thing we brought to that community was access to medical care. Schools, infrastructure, water, energy, communications, internet, access to the internet. So how do you make those sorts of things accessible to the broader community? How can you work with government to put infrastructure in place that we need, but can also be extended so the community sees a much broader benefit once you've done that properly, then you've got a community that wants you there. And so when five guys came up with AK-47s, so these are machine guns, when the when the army uh, uh, did the coup, and it was a bit of been about uh, 2010 or 11, the community stood between us and the army because they wanted to get to the goal and said, you can't go there. They're keeping the lights on. Well, we're work, we're, they're giving us employment. They're keeping the lights on. They're, they're all the roads, infrastructure. They're looking after our helpers, they're going to look after our kids. Our, our, if we have emergency health requirements, they're here. These guys are okay. And they left us alone. And so the, the only real test ultimately is will the community stand up for you? Do you know if you're doing a reasonable job? And I use that as an example of um, that's the real test. In many communities where you don't do that and the local communities don't share in the benefits, then for me that's the resources curse because some people are paying more for the goods and services, so for them it's a negative. It also goes to how do governments use the um, uh, cash flow that they get through taxes and do they reinvest back in infrastructure? And that's what we also encourage to make sure that we have a resources benefit, not a curse. What would you say some of the main challenges are facing our industry in the short, sort of short to medium term? I mean, at the moment, I'm I, I see the industry, especially in the junior market, it is tough for some of these juniors. I've been speaking to a lot of CEOs recently and finding it really tough. Um, how would you see the outlook, say, for over the next few years for the mining industry as a whole? So I think um, it remains tough in terms of access to potential minerals. And and um, clearly in the UK, the, the old a lot of the old coal resources have been worked out. I mean, the country was built on coal in terms of the Industrial Revolution and 
you know, everyone's standard of living is very different to where it was 200 years ago. But those resources are depleted and we can't afford to continue using fossil fuels. So that transition is really important. But to get to the minerals we need for the energy transition, copper, nickel, lithium, and all of those other special alloying materials, it's about access to land and getting access to land. And that's and that's quite difficult. And quite often, if you look at uh, in the US, for example, 70% of the US or North America's copper is on land owned by First Nations groups. Now, good news is those dialogues are improving. And in most cases, the First Nation groups want to see development. And so they're able to work things through, but in some cases not. And so they're still very difficult conversations. So the question is, how do they find an answer? And when somebody says, well, let's just stop oil, you can't do that unless you've got an alternative or you're saying, okay, well, you know, three quarters of the world is not going to have any energy. They're not going to be able to look after themselves. They won't be able to, you know, so agriculture falls over and all the other services that we need and and, bus- and, and communities have been built on, they don't have the energy. So how do you tell China and India that, that you can't have power? Now, what we want to do is see them go from coal to gas or from coal. We want to see them transform towards oil, gas and onto renewables. And it has to be a mix of all of those things. You can't just flick a switch. And so that transition is as much an impact on the mining industry as it is on the energy sector and how we change that over the next 10 to 20 years. We're not going quick enough, but the answer is certainly not just stop something because the people impacted, we're counting in the billions that would be devastated and the impact on them would be just as great as climate change itself. So how do we transition together and get those conversations going in the right way? So I understand their frustration and I understand the challenges we have in the industry, but we have to find a pathway here that gets us there quicker together. Um, as part of your work uh, now, you you mentor obviously mentor people. Um, what kind of people are you mentoring and what kind of things are you mentoring them around? Is there specific subjects um, or topics that you're mentoning them around? And, and I'll take it, obviously, it must be fulfilling you sort of giving back and mentoring people and, and obviously um, giving your expertise to, to the people that you're mentoring. So I, I work with people who are in uh, shipping, um, uh, people who are in uh, communications, telecommunications. Um, so it's quite a, a mixed group. And the things that we talk about are things that as chief executives or very senior executives have to confront every day. So it's always about people and how do you provide the right leadership? How do you build a values and belief system where you're respectful, where you treat people with dignity and respect, where you lead and and challenge people to to do the right thing. It's about sustainability and it's about how you marry up all those things that we know we need to do better on with the core business, which is you may be making candlesticks, you, you might be producing iron ore, you could be providing a service, How do you marry all these community pressures and internal pressures with staff with the ability to produce the goods and services and make money for your shareholders? So it's shareholders, it's employees, it's uh, around your customers, and then it's around local communities and everyone else you impact. And how do you make decisions to to make sure that everyone feels like they've been fairly treated and if you can do that, then there's a good chance you've got a sustainable business for the long term. When I, when people ask me about sustainability, I use the term a sustainable business that is able to deliver a return to shareholders that they want to keep investing. Secondly, it's about people who work for a company that feel like they're being respected, feel like they're being paid fairly, feel like they're being given an opportunity to be the person they want to be. If you look at customers, they want 
to have products that they feel are, have been fairly priced. In local communities, we want businesses that make a contribution and a part of the community and, and feel like partners in the community. The government wants to have their share so that we can share uh, infrastructure and these broader investments. So it's reconciling all those complexities in the role is challenging. And so people who have been in business for 45 years or 50 years like myself, I think it's important that we do our bit to maybe give a bit of experience. We can be someone they can bounce ideas off. Um, a what if? Have you seen this before? What do you think about these types of things? Is there something new that we could think about in our business that maybe they did in mining and they don't do here? Or, gee, if you're talking to someone over here in this business, I wonder if some of their ideas could be transferred into this business. So it's 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 like a network. You're helping them with a network. You're providing experience and giving them someone to bounce ideas off that won't judge them. We'll be there to try and support them, think through the challenges they have as either business leaders or in their particular area of the business. And it must be rewarding for you in doing that. And are you seeing sort of certain results from some of the advice or advice that you're providing? Um, are you are you seeing some of the results from from the input that you've been giving these uh, these uh, people? Well, usually it's the feedback, um, and. It's always nice to hear um, how they've done in applying something. And sometimes it doesn't quite work. And so working that through with them on, okay, well, what was the situation and helping them, uh, if you like, uh, charter a pathway that might be quite complex. But I think the most important thing is seeing their confidence grow as they're able to implement or do things that they see working. And so, you know, if their safety improves, environmental performance improves, the, the bottom line numbers improve, and they feel as though they're being successful, then for me, the most important bit is that they feel it's helping them be a better leader or be more sensitive in areas that they maybe not have uh, been as strong as they could have been. So it's about the feedback you get from people and and uh, if it's helping, then then it does make you know. Um, I've got a couple more questions. Uh, you're one of the, the main speakers at the uh, Resourcing Tomorrow event. Um, what will you what sort of will you be covering uh, in your in your talk? Again, uh, talk about the the opportunity the issues and the opportunities or the opportunities I should say should be uh, more positive the opportunities to do better, how the industry needs to think about itself to, again, improve the way we work with broader society. How do we provide those resources to those industries that need what we're doing? And how might we work with regulators and communities uh, and find solutions to those tougher issues? There's a, there's a great example. If you look at the Woodsmith Mine, up in North uh, Yorkshire today, um, I, I talk about footprints. So uh, at last at last count, they would use about 124 hectares to build the site. They have committed to re of natural woodland. So they're improving the biodiversity footprint of the region. And the tunnel under the reserve means that they don't impact the surface. And so some of the solutions there are world class. They're next to a port, uh, the way they're operating. It's really interesting to see how they've worked with the community and other key players to find solutions. So the resourcing tomorrow and those types of conversations is sharing those positive experiences or looking at more difficult situations and proposing different ways of finding solutions. And that's what those types of forums are about is what do we do? How do we communicate better in terms of what we do? And how do we help people find solutions that get us the materials that we need to make the world a better place? And lastly, uh, and I think your uh, EA was uh, actually asked, wanted me to ask you this. Obviously, you're, you're, you're pretty busy. Your week seems to be really full. Um, is there retirement on the uh, horizon? No, 
No, who'd want to retire? I'm, I'm 65. Um, I guess when I was about 40, I thought, gee, it'd be good to retire at 60. And when I got to 60, I said, oh, no, I couldn't imagine to stop working. And and that would terrify my wife as well. So her point was, you know, I married you for, for uh, well, for good, uh, for better or worse, but not for lunch. And so I suspect I'll continue to keep working as long as I can uh, or as long as uh, people feel I'm adding value or helping them in some way, shape or form. And that's what life's about. Yeah. Mark, really appreciate your time. I know, I know you're, you're really busy. Um, thank you for sharing your, your thoughts with us. Um, if people want to follow your work, are you actively on social media with all the things that you're that you're you're doing? I mean, not as much as I should do. I, I, I'm on LinkedIn, but um, uh, again, uh, I tend not to be uh, on Twitter and stuff like that. My kids tell me I should be, but uh, I should call it X now. Yeah, uh, at least I can show I'm I'm, I'm sort of up there. Uh, but um, yeah, usually that's the best way to do it is through LinkedIn or something like that. Yeah. Well, you're going to be at the um, Resourcing Tomorrow event anyway, so obviously encourage people to, to buy their tickets, come and see you speak, um, and maybe ask any questions that they may have anyway uh, to you. So, Mark, really appreciate your time. All the best for the remainder of the year going into 2024. Thanks, Rob. As always, a pleasure. All the yes, best. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, and those for listening, really appreciate your continued support. Please share, as always, please share this episode uh, with uh, obviously others within the mining industry. Um, but, but as I always say, people outside of the mining industry, uh, Mark has obviously given us a lot of content um, around our, our industry and how we can improve the branding of, of mining. Um, and it's, it's good for obviously not just people within the mining industry, but people outside of our industry, because it's essential for us to uh, evolve. So really appreciate your continued support. And until next time, happy mining. Thank you for listening. Remember to reach out to Rob via the show notes and be sure to subscribe and leave a review. Until next time, happy mining, helping each other to improve the mining industry.